Week 13. This is week 13 of Introduction to Visual Art. Last week we spoke about video art, and the week before that photography, and before that was two-dimensional art, like uh, drawing and painting and printmaking. This week, we're finally getting to three-dimensional art. What is three-dimensional art? Art is, of course, uh, three-dimensional art is, of course, like things in the physical world, things that we can touch, things that we can feel, other no otherwise known as sculpture. So what are sculptural objects? The vast majority of three-dimensional art we will be discussing falls into the realm of sculpture. Like drawing and painting, sculpture is ancient and in some manner has been produced since the dawn of humanity. Sculpture, three-dimensional art that is produced through one or several processes of carving, modeling, or assembling materials. Sculpture can be single a single object, a series of objects, or alterations to a room or environment. The key word is three-dimensional. However, in this section we will focus on sculptural objects. Altered environments will be touched upon in installation and land art. Again, what is 3D art? Three-dimensional art, art that by definition has mass and volume. 3D art exists in real space and the design principles are characterized by having a length, a width, and a depth. And that's versus 2D art, which is defined as flat. The format of and design principles within 2D art is characterized by having a length and a width. Three-dimensional art. Sculptural objects. In considering sculptural processes, the common methods can be simplified into belonging to one of two categories. But of course, many artworks are a hybrid of both methods. One of the categories is additive, and the other is subtractive. This is a photograph of an ancient sculpture known as the Woman of Willendorf, discovered near Willendorf, Austria. It dates between 28,000 and 25,000 years ago. So, this sculpture is made of stone. Do you think it is additive or subtractive? The correct answer would be that it's subtractive. Because imagine taking a rock and you're carving away at it and you remove everything that isn't this sculpture. You remove all the, all the other parts that you throw away. That results in a subtractive, well, this is a subtractive sculpture. This piece is very interesting to me uh, because it is, in fact, very old. Even 28,000 years ago, people were interested in making sculptural forms. Certainly, it wasn't the first sculpture, but it is uh, an, an old one. And... Another interesting thing is that it is obviously a figure. So 28,000 years ago, we were making sculptures and we were interested in the human form. So here's the additive process. Any process in art making where material is added. All additive processes include modeling, assembling, constructing, and casting. Look at this sculpture here by David Altman. He modeled. Modeled means sort of sculpting with, with clay or with other materials like uh, in a traditional sense. So working with clay. Uh, assembling. He assembled the sculpture as well by adding these separate components. 
and he constructed sort of an armature and a frame for it. And he actually cast the human body parts. So making a mold of a person's body and replicating that, that's casting. So modeling. Using a pliable material such as clay or wax, the artist shapes the material into a 3D form. This series of figures was sculpted out of clay. So taking clay from the earth and, and you know, sculpting with it. That is additive. Again, additive, this is assembling. You may recognize this image if you purchased the uh, textbook. This is off the cover of the book uh, by the artist Sarah Z. She assembled this whole environment. Everything here is sort of found or made, but then put together. Assembling and constructing are similar. You could argue that a house has been assembled. Constructing is like assembling, but on a greater scale, often more deliberate. What I mean by more deliberate is that Sarah Z didn't really, uh, she didn't have this vision in her head as Simpark did when they built this skate bowl. This is construction. It is more along the lines of uh, building the house again. This is the underside of that sculpture. So the viewer would be able to come in to the gallery and they'd be underneath this whole form. And then they'd walk up these spiral stairs and be up on this level. This artist, these artists, it's an art collective. They created this sculpture called Free Basin and invited skaters to actually skate in it. Go for it. I think that's a great sculpture because it invites an interaction that uh, many other sculptures don't have. <laughs> this, uh, this constructed sculpture is also an installation. We'll get into installation 
next week. But I wanted to define constructed form. Um, this was installed in Chicago uh, years ago at a place called the Hyde Park Art Center, which is a community art center in um, Hyde Park, close to the University of Chicago. Okay, another uh, additive process is casting. Casting, pouring liquid material into a mold to create a form. There are several materials that can be poured and, when, and then will harden. Consider concrete, plaster, resins, molten metal, etc. So what are we looking at here? This is a great sculpture by the artist Rachel White Reed who in 1993 got her hands on a, a house in a neighborhood in London where many of the other houses around it had been torn down. And ultimately this house was slated for demolition. But what she did, which is so brilliant to me, is she filled the house with cement and then peeled off the exterior of it. And what you're left with is a column of cement that is the interior or the casting of a house. This is another cast sculpture. <coughs> Everything that you see here is made out of bronze. Bronze is a metal uh, that I'm sure you've heard of. Bronze is a metal that you can heat up really hot to, to like uh, 2100 degrees. And then you pour that molten bronze into a mold. And then you remove the mold and you're left with this casting. So the artist here, Jim Dine, he cast all the elements here and then painted them. But this is all bronze. Subtractive uh, is the opposite of additive. So like I said with the woman of Willendorf, who was made out of stone, whoever made it, you can envision they had a rock and they chipped away at it to create the sculpture. Michelangelo, when sculpting this, famously said, uh, said, you know, sculpture is easy you take away everything that isn't the form. And so, this it, that was his explanation of this sculpture, which is, of course, famous, famous sculpture. Um, it's giant. This is 17 feet tall. David is not the size of me and you. David is the size of a giant, which is... I guess funny if you think about it on a biblical sense. But this was uh, carved in marble. A giant piece of marble. And he's got chisels and he's got a hammer and he just goes at it. Another sculpture by Michelangelo. This one is considered uh, an unfinished sculpture, but this gives you an idea of what the process looks like. You've got a giant piece of, of marble, and then he slowly is chiseling away at it, revealing this figure.
I believe we spoke about this before, this, uh, this sculpture by Janine Antoni. So considering additive and subtractive techniques, how was this made? Well, we're looking at a cube of chocolate. How did she get the cube? Well, she built a box and she melted chocolate and poured it into that box. That would be casting. That's how she got the cube. She cast the cube. And then what you see around the edges and corners are all bite marks. She gnawed at it. That's why it's called gnaw. So that eating the chocolate, that is a subtractive process. So in this instance, she used both additive and subtractive. Famously in the Pacific Northwest, there is something called the, uh, like totems. And those are subtractive where the artists making these would cut down a tree and then carve these forms into it. Similarly, they're using chisels and hammers. Okay, let's talk about contemporary methods for sculptural objects. Throughout the 20th century, a huge part of art was rooted in upsetting the status quo of art making. Questions of what is art and what can be art drove several distinct movements, processes, and theory. With the 20th century came metal sculpture. There were, of course, bronze sculptures, you know, thousands of years ago. But in the 20th century, we got manufactured metal. And artists were able to use that. So imagine I-beams and metal plate and steel of all shapes. Assemblage, where sculptures are assembled, became common and was introduced in the 20th century. Something called ready-mades, where it uses found objects and maybe reconsiders them as contemporary sculptures. Mixed media became part of art in the 20th century, where artists used all kinds of different stuff. It didn't matter if it traditionally went together, but they, they put it together. So metal with plastic with wood. We have artists considering light as sculpture or the use of light. And then kinetic sculpture, that's sculpture that moves, and much, much more. There's so much to talk about in 20th century sculpture and of course, we're going to barely scratch the surface. But these are some of the methods that came to be in the 20th century. So here's some metal construction. Of course, metal sculpture has been around for a long, long time. There was the Bronze Age, 3200 to 600 years ago. And, or 3200 to 600 BC and then the Iron Age, 1200 to the year 1 BC. After the start of, of the Industrial Revolution, metal production and processes became industrialized and technologies such as welding, riveting, and soldering came into being in the late 1800s. With new technologies came new art. So what we're looking at here is a gallery show by the artist Richard Serra. One of the things that he just, just did, what made him famous, is he was working with giant pieces of steel. This is all construction-grade steel that he 
isn't forming himself, but he'll have machines and he'll hire people to bend these giant pieces of steel. Assemblage, artwork made through methods of assembling. In assemblage, pre-existing objects take on a new form as artwork. As a collection, the objects often become redundant, providing for a visual texture or are simply brought into a different context. So we're looking at a sculpture by the artist Tara Donovan. And looking at the image, it is difficult to understand what's going on, but let's read the label. It is made out of buttons and glue. So imagine those clear plastic buttons or purplish buttons. They're all just, this is thousands, th tens of thousands of buttons that are just stacked and glued together incessantly. It's a solid mass of buttons. They've all been assembled together. Here's a ready-made. Ready-mades are ordinary manufactured objects that an artist selects and modifies. Do you have an idea of what we're looking at? This is a urinal that the artist just decided to, that it was beautiful and ought to be considered sculpture. This was revolutionary in 1917. In fact, as you see, it is signed by uh, a pseudonym, R. Mutt. Basically, Marcel Duchamp was doing this work and he was really challenging the status quo of the art world. And he did not have enough guts to sign it himself. He might have made a joke by saying R. Mutt. I'm not sure. It's kind of a funny name. But he took a urinal and set it on its back and called it art. It is, in fact, revolutionary. I think that you could argue whether it is art or how artistic it is. But uh, it's it, it really led the way for changing, like a sea change in ideas about sculpture. So here's another ready-made by the artist Piero Manzoni. I'll let you have one guess of what's inside this can. That's right, it's his shit. He, uh, I think it's funny, that's why I've included it, but he literally pooped into cans and sent them in the mail to, to people hoping to get famous, and it worked. Um, he used ready-made cans and ready-made poop. Mixed media. The use of materials and found objects that are not normally elements of a work of art. So, here is an artwork by the artist Robert Rauschenberg called Monogram. Of course, you look at the image and you see a tire and you see a goat or a ram, a goat. Let's see what's on the image list. We have oil, paper, fabric, printed paper, printed reproductions, metal, wood, rubber, shoe heel, and tennis ball on canvas with oil and rubber tire on Angora goat on wood platform mounted on four casters. That is a lot of stuff. Robert Rauschenberg definitely um, pushed the limits on what could be included in a single artwork. Light sculpture. Art created through light and shadow. Artists have always been concerned with the properties of light and shadow. Does anybody remember Caravaggio? a 16th century 
16th, 17th century painter concerned with light and shadow. Let's see. This is Caravaggio. We spoke about him briefly when we were talking about painting and uh, in light and shadow. So artists have forever, or for a very long time at least, been interested in light and shadow. In the 20th century, we started seeing artwork that was all about light and shadow. This is by the artist James Terrell, where what you're looking at is difficult to see, to, to understand. But when you step into the room, which I have, I've seen this artwork. When you step into the room, this really looks like what you see. Um, until you walk closer. So you see a perfect glowing blue rectangle on the wall. And if you walk closer, it, it gets confusing because the sort of depth, brilliance, whatever of it is just so... It's so beautiful. It, it, you start getting bathed in blue light. And then you walk all the way up to the wall and you lean forward and suddenly your head is inside another room. So what the artist did here is he took a room, built a wall in, that divided the two sides and then that wall has this rectangular opening that comes down at like a knife's edge. So this is just a really sharp edge. So imagine the wall is flat on your side and then it goes out at a wedge um, on the other sides. And that room is just bathed with this perfect blue light and it is incredibly trippy when you see it. It is absolutely amazing. Here's a really great sculpture by uh, a, 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 a husband and wife team of artists, Tim Noble and Sue Webster. This is a nice assemblage of, you know, two wooden step ladders, discarded wood, light, and a projector. We'll see the light and projector here. But you see really awesome or interesting I would say sculpture and I see like kind of a human form here a woman's leg sticking out there or a person's leg and then a leg here and similarly here I see looks like maybe a humanish form that's kind of sitting on a chair ish and looks like this person sitting on a chair ish So turn off the lights and turn on uh, a, a projection of light and you see this amazing shadow. So they're really using light and shadow. The artwork isn't only these objects, but it is also the shadow, which is absolutely beautiful. Here's kinetic sculpture. Kinetic sculpture are sculptures that move. Something called Lobster Trap and Fishtail by Alexander Calder. You may understand what's going on here. It's called a mobile, where you have these perfectly balanced elements that all move and it's not always lined up so perfectly, but they all swing on each joint. That's called a mobile. 
This is from 1939. Um, you may think, oh, it's interesting-ish. But let me tell you something that will really blow your mind. Prior to Alexander Calder, mobiles did not exist. Not really. You might have, when you were a baby in a crib, you might have had a mobile above your head. Well, if it wasn't for Alexander Calder, you might not have had that. He really developed the concept. So this is a kinetic sculpture in that it, if you see a sculpture like this in the museum or one of his, it's just gently rotating, gently moving. That's kinetic. Here's another uh, kinetic sculpture. We have a room inside of a box that's on in, in this big frame and that room actually turns, that big frame turns the room, it rotates it. And so you see in this installation of, of it, you see all this junk in the room just kind of broken and tumbling around inside. And so that's what the sculpture became. Let me show you what it started out as. I think it's pretty great. So if you can imagine, that room started out as a sort of set for this performance. The artist um, works with choreographers often uh, and dancers, and he built a set for this performance to happen. And so what we have here is a woman walking on the wall. She's a dancer, but she's about to do something pretty amazing. Oh, got him. That guy, he's the artist. All right, that's what I have for kinetic sculpture. Let's look at some other sculptures that I pulled up. Those are all the terms and definitions. So here are some great sculptures. A sculpture at the Louvre Museum in France, the famous one with Mona Lisa in it. This sculpture is called Winged Victory. It is, uh, it's Greek, and it dates from uh, the about the years 200 to 190 BC. And then the figure is about eight feet tall. This is a stone sculpture, and I'm going to show you some stone sculptures to start off. The reason is 
older sculptures tend to be stone because number one, they uh, were trendy. And number two, they didn't really know of anything more permanent than stone. And number three, if they did make sculptures, which they did, out of other materials, they rotted and like wood, and they, they were mostly gone. So what's left, especially in terms of European sculpture from, you know, 2,000 years ago, are stone sculptures. Here's another great stone sculpture. This is from uh, the 1650s. This is a, a Renaissance slash Baroque sculpture by the artist Bernini, The Ecstasy of St. Teresa. This is at the altar of a church in, I think, Rome. And um, if not Rome, in Italy. But we're still... Still, we're seeing uh, stone sculpture. Stone was very in vogue at the time. They had technologies for bronze at this point, but bronze was actually uh, more expensive and we didn't and, and and more rare. So, stone and marble sculpture was still very common. This is another sculpture by Michelangelo. This is uh, the tomb of Pope Julius II. And uh, this guy, this guy seated here, the one with the horns coming out of his head, that's supposed to be Moses. It is an absolutely beautiful sculpture, beautiful tomb. Um... But he, let me tell you a story. There used to be a time in which people genuinely believed that Moses had horns coming out of his head. I know, that sounds crazy. It actually uh, comes from a mistranslation of ancient Hebrew text. And so Europeans were reading Bibles or they had access to Bibles, at least the priesthood did, that were copies of copies of copies of copies of this ancient text. And so for most of the Renaissance, people really truly believed that uh, Moses had horns when the original text actually said that Moses had light emanating from his head and uh, it was mistranslated as horns. Apparently the words are similar. This is an interesting uh, sculpture. Um, it's an old Buddha. There's this valley in Afghanistan uh, called the Bamiyan Valley. And the Bamiyan Valley was known until quite recently for having these giant Buddhas. And so there were these, these monks and these Buddhist monks in the 600s uh, that were living in this valley. And they spent their entire lives uh, living in caves and then they would emerge from the caves and they would carve these giant Buddhas. There were, you know, several of them at one point. Absolutely amazing. This Buddha uh, is a hundred and eight was 180 feet tall. Now, if you were to go to that site uh, in Afghanistan now, you would actually you would notice that the Buddha is no longer there. And that's a, a sad story um, in that um, in 2001, uh, Al-Qaeda had control of the valley and they uh, 
actually started um, removing these. They started blowing up, like using explosives to destroy these false uh, idols. And so we lost these uh, these giant Buddhas. Of uh, it was like a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, but absolutely beautiful. I wish I was able to see them. I was aware of them at a fairly young age, and I I thought that they were great, and then I was rather heartbroken to find out that they were uh, exploded. All right, here's another stone sculpture from 1882 by the artist... Uh, Rodin. This is 1880s were a time in which stone was becoming, was still very popular, but it wasn't the only thing that was popular. Bronze became more popular. But I included Rodin in this, uh, in particular, because I know we, we jumped quite a, quite a bit uh, from the Renaissance um, in ancient to here. But I included Rodin because uh, he is one of those artists that was around when sculpture started changing and be started becoming what we call modern. And so this is stone, but it doesn't have the same detail as the Renaissance sculpture or even sculpture 50 or 100 years before. It's slowly becoming more abstract. This is another sculpture that he's famous for. This one's made out of bronze, the thinker. Again, uh, a little bit more abstract. This one might be more abstract than this one, but it's kind of rough. The attention to detail isn't so interesting to the artist or to the public. They're more interested in uh, seeing the texture and the... Uh, the sort of abstraction, the slight abstraction from real life. And so in the tradition of Rodin, we have this artist named Constantine Brancusi. And Constantine Brancusi is, uh, I, I've got several pieces to show you by him. And I think he's a really great person to show and to talk about because his work really follows the trajectory of, of popular sculpture in the uh, 20th century, where everything starts to become more and more abstract. This uh, is a woman's head laying on its side, um, cast bronze, and it has detail. You have a mouth and you have a nose and you have hair and you have like eyes or like eye bulges and um, it, so it's there. He er, Earlier than this Brancusi was sculpting figures that were had more detail, more information in them. But in 1910 this is what he was producing. Here's something from 1913. He's a little bit more abstract. Here's 1920. This is called the newborn. Do you guys see a newborn, the head of a newborn baby here? I understand that it might be difficult to recognize, but the way I interpret it is, all right, let's talk about this piece. You have the the ridge or the nose going up through the forehead of this woman. I see that ridge being the nose up through the forehead. The eyes would be on either side. What is this shape? I see it as an open mouth. So you're looking at a, a baby-ish form with no eyes, uh, it, but like a little mark for a nose and a big open mouth and he is screaming or crying. And 
that to me looks like his tongue looks like a crying baby to me it is for sure not a baby's head or not something that looks like a baby's head but abstraction started becoming what was in mode what it was in fashion and like I said Brancusi really followed that trajectory this is a pretty big sculpture pretty famous one by him called bird in space I don't see any wings on this bird frankly I'm not sure I see uh, much other than what might be the breast of the bird and then what might be the start of the tail feathers and then it's kind of flattish at this point I see what might be a beak a breast and then if there are wings those wings are flat to his side and this bird has made himself as streamlined as possible because he's traveling through space he's shooting like a rocket that's how I interpret the sculpture around that time when uh, Brancusi was becoming more and more uh, abstract we have another artist named Marcel Duchamp if you remember Marcel Duchamp did the the urinal and he, that urinal and this are considered something called ready-mades ready-mades are found objects that are put together in a way to reinterpret the, uh, the object to re get perhaps give it a new life or new purpose or even remove the function from the object and and make it uh, functionless and maybe in a way that art is functionless in his eyes so Duchamp had a wheel like a bicycle wheel and he had a stool and he put them together and it's no longer a stool and a bicycle wheel because the function is removed when you pair them together it the it doesn't quite make sense um, but it is all about the form so that's Marcel Duchamp he was on the sort of crazy or more lunatic end of things in the art world in the early uh, 20th century but um, art sort of started going in his favor I'd say in the tradition of Duchamp, um, and of course this is 40 years later, is this sculpture by the artist Louise Nevelson. These are all scrap pieces of wood. In fact, she would walk around town and she would pick up through the garbage. She was one of those crazy ladies that would pick through the garbage and she would find these interesting pieces of wood. And then she would take them back to her studio and assemble them, sort of found objects assembled together, creating this big sculptural form. This is always, well, I've seen several versions of this, and they're always flat against the wall. It's always sort of a series of boxes. Another Louise, Louise Bourgeois. She's an interesting lady. I could teach an entire class on her. She's one of the most important artists of the 20th century. And a lot of her art's gross. A lot of her art um, has penises in it or body parts or big giant spiders. This woman had some staying power. She first started making art in, I don't know, the 1950s. And that's after she already had children and a family. And then she continued making art all the way until like, 
I don't, I want to say like 2006 or 8 or 10. She lived a really long time and uh, died at about 100 years old. And she uh, was making art all the way through her um, uh, her adult life. But this is a beautiful piece. It is uh, cast bronze and it is hanging from a wire. This artist, Robert Gober, is sort of one of the kings of really creepy stuff. Anyway, this is mild. Uh, one of the things that he really liked using in his art was human hair. But, uh, and there's human hair in this sculpture. The, the hair and the legs. It's, he's pulling out his own hair and sticking it in the leg here. This is made out of found objects, but also he made a leg out of beeswax. He took a, he made a sculpture of his own leg and reproduced it in wax. And then the sculpture is this portion of leg pushed flat against the wall. A great piece by Nam June Pike. Uh, Nam June Pike was one of the people. He was actually uh, we didn't talk about him last week, but he was actually early in the uh, video art world. But really, he made his mark uh, in animation and video manipulation. His sculptures were often these machines and these televisions. And so we've got these closed loop circuits where you've got a camera here with, an, with its image tied into these other television monitors. And this is a player piano. And I believe the well, what a player piano is, is a piano that uh, is mechanized and it runs a program and and uh, saw it strike. It pushes its own buttons and strikes keys, and uh, a song comes out. Anyway, this is a, a song that he uh, would have composed, and then sort of videos that go along it. So it's like a player piano with TVs mounted on top of it. I find this interesting. Um, an artist named Donald Judd, who was active in the 1960s all the way till the 1990s when he died. Um, this is a big sculpture. It is maybe boring, but also super interesting. It's great when, when you're in a room with a sculpture like this because it's all about perception. It's all about how the color makes you feel and parallel lines and and uh and the rawness of the construction so this is all enameled aluminum so it's just painted aluminum that's been folded into these rectangular trays and then set on edge and bolted together but he was a heavy hitter of the 20th century another heavy hitter of the 20th century is Klaus Oldenburg he was, uh, I want to say, friends with Andy Warhol. Um, he was a sculptor that did pop art. And he made lot of, lots of sculptures about food. Uh, and then he, later in his life, was making these massive outdoor sculptures. Um, that if you're at a museum, uh, say in Minneapolis or in Cleveland, um, you'll see these big sculptures outside. But uh, he was making these soft sculptures, and I think that this is a funny, funny sculpture. It is a toilet, of course, um, a soft toilet, uh, all made out of fabric, and then there would be some sort of armature inside, so it's all sewn together. And then we're going, we're going to go from one toilet to another. This one is from 2016. 
by the artist Maurizio Catalan. And it is a functioning toilet made 100% out of gold. In order to see this, you'd have to go to New York City to the Guggenheim Museum, where they actually removed a, uh, a toilet from their bathroom and um, replaced it with a gold toilet, and it's all functioning. So if you want to know the best place to go, use the restroom in New York City. It is at the Guggenheim Museum, and you can uh, wait in line to take a crap in a gold toilet. I think it's great um, in its own way. I think he's making fun of the art world a little bit. Uh, when it came out, it, it got a lot of attention. Um, so you pull the handle and it flushes just like a regular toilet does. An interesting artist named Kwame Plinza. I don't have a lot of contemporary art in this presentation, um, but that's okay. The reality is, like I said, there's so much, so much uh, art out there, so much sculpture. I can't really do it in just one class. I just want to give you a taste of what's going on. So this is a really great sculpture by the artist Kwame Plinza. He's a Spanish artist. And... This looks funny. It looks real, like it looks like proportional and everything. But if you were to see it from the side, you'd find out that the face is kind of smushed. It's got a forced perspective on it that's really uh, quite interesting. So this outdoor sculpture, cast iron. And this is another one of his pieces on view at... Uh, at... Uh, an event called the Freeze Art Fair, I think. See, and then it suddenly turns in this weird pancake. And then, let's watch that again. So you see, it comes together. When you see these in real life, it is really unnerving um, but interesting at the same time because it looks so good at certain angles and then you're like what the heck's happening at other angles okay that is it for uh, this week's presentation on sculpture after this be sure to uh, watch the Art of the Day presentations, and then um, take the quiz.